Silently now I wait for Thee, ready, my God, Thy will to see. Open my heart, illumine me, Spirit divine. After Rubio's uh, criticism for drinking water, I'm almost afraid to take a drink. Uh, <clears throat> folks, you know things are getting pretty desperate in this country when you see things like, uh, well, one of the things that really impressed me was when Brother P.C. Dorsey in a uh, a very unhealthy uh, <clears throat> condition uh, was determined that he was going to go vote, and he did, because he sensed the, the grave situation here in this country. Back some time ago, I uh, had a, a gentleman that uh, took my concealed carry class and he was in his uh, middle 80s and had just gotten out of the hospital not many days before the class. And he was determined he was going to uh, enjoy his Second Amendment right and he was going to get a concealed carry permit. And he came and he took the class. And the man was so sickly he had to sit down at a chair to do his shooting. I was informed... Uh, shortly after that, that he passed away. Uh, and I thought to myself, that's really something. And then I got a phone call uh, <clears throat> just a couple of days ago from a man that's 91 years old. <laughs> and he wants to take my concealed carry class. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I told him, I said, well, that would, that would be fine. And he said, uh, he said, well, uh, son, he said, I, um, <clears throat> he said, I, I fought in the Second World War. He said, I was a paratrooper that went in with, uh, I can't remember what regiment it was. You remember, uh, you met him today, uh, Victor. It was 505-something, 580-something uh, airborne. But anyway, uh, he landed over there in a, a nest of Germans and <clears throat> spent uh, several months as a prisoner of war. And he told me, he said, you know, I know how to shoot machine guns and, and large uh, cannons and things like that. But he said, I, I, I'm, I never spent much time shooting a, a small gun. I, um, and... I think that we need to get together and go out and do a little practice. And so I went out with him today, and he got that part of the class behind him. And I was very impressed at what a 91-year-old man could do with a firearm in his hand. Well, you might wonder, what in the world does all that have to do with the message today, which is entitled, What Must I Do to Be Saved? I think, for one thing, if we could discover the kind of desperation and urgency and concern that some of these people have going on in their life concerning this nation and the world and how it's going to affect their own lives, as it might relate to the issue of salvation, we could see some things getting done. Uh, and... <clears throat> I know that all of us have uh, friends, we have acquaintances, we have relatives that are not saved, and and our our mission in life is to be a witness uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ to the end that others might come to know Him as their personal Savior. And so tonight I want to bring a message called, What Must I Do to Be Saved? What Must I Do to Be Saved? <coughs> Um, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16. 
This was a question uh, made by the uh, the jailer. You remember uh, when Paul and Silas had been put in prison for uh, preaching the gospel. I'd like for you to begin reading with me at verse 23 of Acts chapter 16. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed, and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? That's the question. What must I do to be saved? There's been a time in my life that I asked that question. I'm certain that that's true of every person that's in here that does know the Lord as their personal Savior. This is not unusual that a person would ask such a question because we're all born lost and in, in need of salvation. And this is one of the most con important considerations you'll ever make. Uh, how, can, how can I have a right relationship with the Lord and know it? What must I do to be saved? And so I'd like to begin these thoughts tonight with a little backdrop into this particular setting. Uh, this event was about 20 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, this was a time period where the disciples were described as those that had turned the world upside down. Uh, this was said in Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. The effect of the disciples after the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus was incredible. I, I, I delight in, in bringing out the point when I have an opportunity that one of the most amazing evidences for the truth of this book is the calendar itself. And how that something had to happen some 2,000 years ago to give us this, this present uh, uh, dating system that we have. And, and it's traced back to, to this, this time period when uh, things happened that literally turned the world upside down. And the world would never be allowed to forget it. And, of course, this is the, uh, the work of the sovereign God uh, working through men to preserve the most authenticated fact in the course of human history <coughs> was the life, the death, and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that's why we have the calendar that we have. And the evidence related to all these things is beyond imagination. And so the answer to the jailer's question was not secretive. These things were in the open. It, it was known by everybody. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were uh, at the Passover when these events took place. And the Lord Jesus was not crucified in a corner as Paul said in his testimony uh, to Agrippa, he was crucified on a hill and brought open daylight. And so uh, it, it was a political 
uh, nightmare for uh, the, the the government at that time. It it was a, it was a crisis for the religious leaders at that time, and they were doing everything in the world that they could. Whether you talk about the uh, secular government or the religious leaders to to keep it uh, undercover and by lying and by deception and and by their own influence they tried to keep this information under the lid what you might say but it didn't do any good and people were getting saved and and the power of their testimony was was not refutable it couldn't be refuted uh, what they were saying because there were so many witnesses of these events I mean how can you review refute the evidence which is witnessed by thousands upon thousands of people and so the message concerning the Lord Jesus was being proclaimed everywhere but I'd like for you to notice the backdrop to some of these things that led up to uh, this Philippian jailer asking this question, what must I do to be saved? Um, if you'll read with me at verse 14, it says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. Now, as we're reading this, I want you to think about something. If you're sitting here tonight and you're exercising your heart about your relationship with the Lord and you want to be saved and know it, think about all these things because the Bible is just a marvelous book in this regard because it gives us all kinds of examples of people that were not saved that got saved. And, and if we look into their experience and, and what they understood and what happened in their minds and hearts, then we might uh, see that as, as, as wonderful instruction for ourselves. And so we read on, and when she was baptized in her household, she brought us saying, besought us saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. So here's a person that uh, she wanted to be around Christians, and that's very important because this is what happens to you. Uh, when the Lord begins to work in your heart, it, it, you, you have this desire to, to want to be around people that, that know the Lord and, and think about the quality of, of, of testimony that um, Lydia had an opportunity to be with here in the Apostle Paul and Silas. And she constrained us, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, this is an incredible thing because here's a, here's a, a, a damsel that's uh, demon-possessed. And the devils that are in her recognize the influence and testimony of the Apostle Paul and Silas. Uh, this demon is speaking through these women saying, uh, this woman saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, this is very important as it relates to the Philippian jailer, and, and all of these things are part of the backdrop of this man coming to this point of asking this desperate question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas 
and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And so the reasons for their incarceration were well known. Even the demon recognized what was going on. They were preaching. the way of salvation. That that's, should be of prime interest to a person that wants to be saved. How do I, how do I get saved? How can I know that I'm saved? How, how does a person get saved? Well, here was the Apostle Paul showing exactly how this was to be done. And this jailer had to have known about this because you see the reasons for their being put in prison were not secretive. They were out there teaching people how to be saved. Not only that, he was one of the numbers of the disciples that were turning the world upside down. This was known everywhere what was being preached. And I'm telling you, that time period was so saturated with these kinds of, of activities, the world would never be allowed to forget it. And so God intervened into the human affairs and, and preserved these things for us in a notable way. It's called the calendar. Approximately seven years later, <clears throat> Paul said the following to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. He said, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love that verse. I've been enjoying this verse for many, many years. And every time I read it, it's, it's as fresh to me as the first time I ever noticed it. The simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Folks, let me tell you something. Salvation is not complicated. It absolutely is not. It's the devil that complicates it. It's our minds that complicate it. It's not being honest with God that complicates it. But the message from heaven on God's part is absolutely simple. It's not complicated at all. I looked this word simplicity up in Strong's Concordance. And, and it's interesting sometimes the additional thoughts that uh, you discover when you, you look up a word and, and think about its definition. And, and the word simplicity means singleness. Sincerity without self-seeking. Now, now, now think about this definition as it relates to Christ. We're talking about the simplicity that is in Christ. We're talking about the character of God. We're talking about the character of Jesus Christ and what we're learning about him as a person is his sincerity and how that his whole involvement with humankind is selfless. There's no self-seeking in this. Uh, sometimes people get the idea that the Lord somehow or other is rewarded by our worship of Him, worshiping Him. And we get to thinking in our perverted way that 
this is something that God feeds off of. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. God doesn't need our worship. And, and his, his uh, command in there to worship the Lord and serve only him or him only is not because he needs our worship by any respect. The reason he revealed that need on our part is for our benefit. It's the same kind of thing as a parent that has children and the parent wants respect from those children because it's for their benefit if the parent is respected. When you look up to somebody and you respect them, it's not for their benefit. It's for yours if what they're telling you is good and safe. And this is the whole mentality of God as he has revealed himself to this world. He is not a self-seeking God at all. What's also interesting to discover is in this Greek word for simplicity, it means folded together. Folded together. Folded together as one. And, and what's interesting in the genius of God is he chooses words to convey this message from heaven. He has in this single word the eternal plan of God which is to take a person here on this earth that wants to know how to be saved and fold them in such a way with himself that they become one, which is singleness. And his purpose in doing this is not selfish. He loves us because he's a God of love. It also means without dissimulation. If you look the word dissimulation up, which is one that's not very often used in, uh, in everyday language uh, by many, if you look the word up, it, it means the opposite of, of singleness. It means the opposite of sincerity. So it means to not be sincere, to not be honest. And so the Lord is without dissimulation. So he's emphasizing here in the meaning of this word his sincerity, his honesty. He came into this world to save us from our, our sin. To embrace a view of Christ that is not consistent with his true character and nature is dissimulation. That's what unbelief is. Unbelief is dissimulation. It's, it's changing Christ into a person that he is not. I think that's one of the important points of Brother Jim's messages on Calvinism because Calvinism completely misrepresents the character of God, the nature of God. And so it's important for us to get it, get it right. Now, as we consider some thoughts here on the subject of, of salvation and what a person must do in, in order to be saved, uh, there are two critical hurdles or misconceptions that hinder a lot of people in coming to the Lord. Now, a number of these things I have mentioned before, these things have been taught in the, in the church here uh, many, many times over the years. But you never know when you've got an audience like this, uh, when people are listening and when they're not, when they're asleep, when they're alert. You never know uh, where their minds are in the course of a message. They might be thinking about other things and... It's amazing sometimes how things are so familiar to the speaker and to many others in the congregation. But one of the biggest mistakes you'll ever make 
is thinking that some of these thoughts uh, do not need repeating. Yes, they do. The message of this book is repeated over and over and over, literally thousands of times, from cover to cover in the Bible. The Lord uses different settings and different people, but the message is always the same. The message never changes. People get saved today the same way they got saved 100 years ago or 2,000 years ago or the way Adam and Eve got saved. It's the same. But we have countless examples of how salvation takes place and, it, and it's approached from all these different angles to give us different facets of this marvel, this wonder that a person could be converted to be like God and to have his nature and to have his character. So I think one of the misconceptions that hinders our coming to the Lord is that of not believing his character and his nature. Not believing his character and nature. Well, what is his nature? What is his character? Many years ago, I discovered something in myself. This was private. This was something that happened all alone with nobody knowing anything about what was going on in my mind and what I was dealing with and struggling with. But for many years, I struggled with assurance of salvation. And uh, <clears throat> as you look around inside and you do this, what they call introspection, sort of examining yourself, you discover a lot of troubling things. And I did. I realized that in my mind was wickedness. In my heart was wickedness. And and I often wonder how in the world could a person be saved and, and claim to be saved that had such things going on in there. And so I struggled. As a matter of fact, uh, many years ago, I, I taught uh, Pilgrim's Progress here in school and one of the courses that we had. And, uh, and uh, John Bunyan... Uh, he suffered the same experience that I did. And, and it was a comfort for, to, to me to, to discover that, that in his journey, uh, he had that same problem. Uh, so if you read Pilgrim's Progress, you'll see what I'm talking about. But a person can be a Christian, can be saved, and struggle. And it's important to realize this. I wish I had time to develop that particular thought more, but I want to go through and, and, and get into some of these things here. Where there's a, there, there's a nature in us that, that wants to question God. And it's amazing how we will put our wisdom and our understanding above the wisdom and understanding of God. And we'll read the Bible and we'll put God in our own court with us as the judge and we'll question why he would do some things the way he did. And what that does is it calls in question his nature and his character. Well, in the privacy of my own studies, I realized something one day that changed everything. It would be a turning point in my life and in my attitude toward God that would never be the same again. It would make me different from that day forward. And that's why I want to tell it to you. Because it was good for me. It was one of the most wonderful things that I've ever experienced in my relationship with the Lord. I came to the conclusion that there wasn't a thing in the world wrong with God. But there was a lot wrong with me. And for me and, and, and my pride to sit in judgment on God was a grievous sin. And I got convicted about that thing. 
And so I began to study a little bit about the nature of God. And one of the things that came to my mind was that all throughout the scriptures, he presents himself as being innocent. That's why the lamb is a, is a, is a, is a symbol in the Bible. It's an animal, a symbolic animal uh, of, of the innocence of God. And to take this innocent lamb and, and offer it up as a sacrifice, which was a type of Christ, it carries the idea of his innocence. And how that the, the one who would die in our place, he, he could not be like we are. He couldn't be a sinner. He had to be innocent. He had to be. And, and, so, and somehow or other, for, for me to, to sit in judgment on God, as though somehow or other, some of these things that are hard to understand in the Old Testament, uh, was a result of a God that is really not innocent, at least in my judgment, was a grievous mistake. And the Lord, as it were, got me in a corner and showed me a thing or two. And he showed me I am eternally innocent. I am forever innocent. And I've never forgotten that. He showed me that he is forever good. He's the eternally good God. He's the loving God. It's the most summary term of the character of God you can find in the Bible. God is love. And to think of him any other way is an insult to his integrity. And I was mightily convicted about that. He is right, which is just a shortened... Uh, a way of saying righteous. Righteousness is rightness. He's right. He's always right. <coughs> he is just. He is merciful. He is kind. He is gracious. He is selfless. He is meek. He is lowly in heart. He is humble. He is pure. He is holy. Any other conception of him is a corruption or dissimulation of his true character and nature. And you would do well if you're here tonight to take this to heart and never fall into the sin of questioning the nature and the character of God. When you read things that you can't understand, don't rest the scriptures to your own destruction because that's what you'll do if you begin to think bad thoughts toward God. That's a big mistake. And so Paul wrote the Corinthians and said, But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. That word simplicity has to do with what I'm talking about here. It has to do with the nature and the character of God, the eternal innocence of God, the eternal... Uh, goodness of God and all of these things that we mentioned. And to think of him any other way is dissimulation and a great sin. But you also see that the on the surface the word simplicity which I like to think of the term this way. We don't have to get complicated about it. Paul is simply saying that the message of salvation is simple. It's not complicated. It's very simple. The instructions in the Garden of Eden were very simple. The way of salvation was very simple. It's very simply presented in the Scriptures. And you see the message of the cross right there in Genesis. But it's a simple message. It was a simple solution. It was a problem that was so big, only God could have resolved the problem. And he did. And with God, all things are possible. And he can save a person. He can do that.
Now there's another misconception that uh, causes people to stumble. And besides this matter of questioning the character of God. And again, these are things that come from right out of my heart because these are things that I learned in my own struggles in my relationship with the Lord. And one of the things that I was tripped up over for a long time was the subject of faith and what it meant to believe. What does it mean? And as I've re related to you before, I had a complete misconception of the nature of faith and the nature of trust and the nature of belief as it relates to God. And the reason is because I was told, not only by other Christians, but preachers, that it was a sin to question God. I was told that one time by a preacher. It's a sin to question God. You're supposed to just believe. And this was kind of hammered into me as a, as a, I guess, a, an easy way to get out of things that they didn't understand. And, and they, they taught an easy believism message, and, and the easy believism message was, well, you just have to believe that it's the truth and you'll be saved. And don't be complicated and don't question it. And so what they were offering me was a kind of blind faith. That, that really didn't have reasons undergirding it that you could ever go out and discuss with somebody. As a matter of fact, I was a part of, uh, from time to time as I was coming along as a teenager, a part of little groups that would go out because the Sunday school teacher or whoever in the church would stir us up and say, well, let's go out witnessing the night and let's, let's have a particular night that we'll all get together and we'll all go witnessing. And so I would get with them and, and go out and we would knock on doors and and really we weren't being led by the Lord. We were being uh, pressured into doing something so that other people, people could feel better about themselves and that they were going out serving God and they were doing something for God. And so I'd, I'd come along and and really the truth was I went along to keep up my image because I didn't want to be thought of as somebody that was not a Christian. And so if Christians are supposed to go out and witness, then I'm going to go along with the crowd and, and get the credit for being a Christian and get numbered with all of those that went out and did a work for God. And I've, I've knocked on some doors and, and I've witnessed to some people and what I tried to win them to was my opinion. They had their opinion, I had my opinion, and I was trying to win them to my opinion, and it, it had no more depth to it than that. And I thought that was what being a witness was, winning them to my opinion, which was a faith without any evidence whatsoever or argument or system of logic or anything else that you could appeal to a an intelligent mind with so that they would... Uh, be interested in doing the same thing, and that is trusting the Lord with their eternal soul. And so I got hold of a definition of faith that was not biblical. A definition of trust that was not biblical. A definition of believing that was not biblical at all. And then when I got into college, it was reinforced the lie that I was taught in the church was reinforced by the state. And when I went off to college, the professors would get up there and say, well, you can have faith in God, but it's not scientific. You're talking about a dimension that cannot be proven. You're talking about uh, an invisible dimension but if you, if you want to be an educator, 
if you want to be an intellectual, then you have to think. You have to you have to uh, mold your life around things that that have evidence. Uh, there there has to be fact associated with the things that you believe, and then you'll have the power to persuade people if you have evidence and you have fact. And they were right. They were absolutely right. But they were saying that evidence and faith had nothing to do with Christianity because it deals with an invisible dimension where there is no evidence. You just believe, and that's all you can do. And I was taught that uh, this believing is, is in reality, I learned this in the psychology department, is really just a crutch because we sense that there is the concept of eternity. We're going to die, and we've got this concept of eternity, and so what if it turns out that after we do die, all that these preachers have been saying is right? And there is a God out there. Then... Um, best thing for me to do is just uh, do like the psychologist said. Uh, lean on the crutch. Lean on the crutch. Because belief in God is nothing more than leaning on a crutch. It's just a, it's just a, a, a weak hope that after it's all over and done, it might just turn out that way. So, the best advice, the best counsel they could give is, uh, well, what you need to do is, is live the best moral life that you can so that when you die and you get on the other side and it turns out to be true, then you'll have good works to stack up against the bad and the Lord will look at the good works and weigh it into balances and if the good outweighs the bad, then you'll be saved. And folks, I was taught this kind of thing. And I had this reinforced in my mind when I got to the university. So I was allowed to have my Christianity, but it was too embarrassing to go public with it. And I remember the chairman of the Department of Philosophy called me in because of a paper that I wrote. And he told me, he said, uh, you can enjoy these thoughts of faith in the walls of your mind, but don't bring it into the class. We're philosophers in the class. And we lean on real intelligence in the class. But not on a faith that has no evidence, that has no actuality related to it. And so I was in a, a real despair about this, this situation related to God. It was after I came down here to Calvary Memorial Church and began to run into people like Pastor Kelly and Dr. Henry Morris, who I met at a convention, a Christian Educators Convention down in Tampa, Florida, back before we even had a school. And Pastor Kelly and I met him. We met Dr. Rush Denny at the same time. And I began to get his books and read them. I can't tell you how many times I've sat there in my window, looking out my window as I study my Bible. And I would pray and I would talk to the Lord and I would tell him to just go over and, and hug uh, uh, Dr. Henry Morris for me and just tell him how much I appreciate those books that he wrote. And his love for the Lord and his his understanding and his wisdom that God gave him. And this is real, folks. I do this. I thank God for that man. I think in the mind of God, he's one of the greatest Christians of our, our generation. And, of course, there are many others, but I'm just talking about him because the impact that this man had on me is beyond imagination. And all of a sudden, I began to realize that the Christian faith has evidence. 
It's based upon facts that cannot be refuted. And, 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 and to run across what Dr. Luke had to say in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 about many infallible proofs, it's in the Bible. I never heard a preacher bring that out. Can you prove God? Yes. Is there evidence that proves Him? Yes. It's everywhere. How in the world a person can live in this world and not believe in the true and living God as exactly as He has revealed Himself to be is beyond imagination to me at this point in my life. I don't see how a person can live without the Lord. And without the certainty of knowledge concerning God and the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. I can't imagine to myself a person who claims to be a Christian and goes out here and knocks on a door and his reason for being there is not a passion that God himself has put in the heart. It has nothing to do with what somebody else wants to do. I don't even like to go out witnessing with other people. I don't. What I love to do and I get the greatest joy out of it is when the Lord stirs me up to go out and speak to somebody. And I, I see the Lord working. And it's a blessing. And we need more of this kind of thing. It's an encouragement to me to see this in other, other Christians and there's a bunch of them here in this church that are like that that know the Lord, and they're serious about it. And they serve the Lord, and they serve the Lord with a passion. And that's a wonderful thing to behold. And if the young people in this church do not get a handle on what I'm talking about right now, I'm telling you this church is going to go up in ashes. You young people better listen to me. Because this is the truth, what you're hearing. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And you may have heard that a hundred times or, and twice more, but no truer words could ever be uttered. I went to uh, a Japanese restaurant the other night over in Fedville, and in that restaurant there was a, a huge aquarium, and it was full of these exotic fish. And I was standing there looking at those things. I just marvel. I, I, I love to go and, and look at things like that. And, uh, and I was looking at these, these fish, and they're just amazing. And I, I noticed in the colorations, they're just, the colors are just amazing to me. But here's this, this, this fish, and he's, he's yellow. And he's got these black and blue stripes on him. And what was interesting to me, and I called my wife over and showed it to her, um, there was a stripe that started at the very top and wrapped all the way around him. As a matter of fact, they wrapped all the way around the, the entire fish. And one of those stripes came down and came across his eye. And it was exactly, it was like the line was unbroken. And it went through the middle of that fish's eye. The stripe did. And I thought to myself, how in the world could somebody look at that and not see God? And I stood there and I, I just looked at it and it was though, I'm telling you, it, it could not have been a clearer testimony to me of Jesus Christ than if he had been there in the flesh. You can see the signature of God. You can see the work of God. You can understand what the Lord meant when he said, if you believe not my word, then believe me for the work's sake. And his works are everywhere. If we'll just open our eyes and see it. And there's power in that. And so, one of the big misconceptions about Christianity is a misunderstanding of the nature of faith and trust and belief. Let me tell you something. Having faith in God 
is absolutely no different than having faith in any other person you've ever met on this earth. Why would you ever have faith in somebody? Would it not be because of what you know about them? Why would you ever trust somebody? Why would I have a student uh, come up and, and, and carry out some, some responsibility that would require trust. What is behind you trusting a student or anyone to do anything that's important for you? Is it not based on what you know about them? What about believing in somebody? Folks, for me to believe in somebody, I have to have some experience with them. I have to know something about them. And, and, and sometimes it, it's, it becomes critical when you invest trust in somebody and faith in somebody. And you go out and you tell other people, oh yeah, man, I, I don't think you're going to have any problem with this person. I, I believe in them. I believe in them. When they tell me something, I believe it. When they tell me something, I believe it. Why would, I, why would I say that I believe somebody if I don't have something undergirding that position of mind? Well, why would I believe in God without requiring the same thing? Let me tell you something. The Lord doesn't want you to believe Him without a reason. You'll never amount to anything as a Christian. If you don't have the power of facts, the power of evidence undergirding your belief and your faith and your trust of the person of God, you've got to have that or you're going to have a powerless testimony. You'll never amount to anything as a Christian. All you'll be able to do is go around and give people your faith opinion. No, this is my, I believe there's a God, and this is my opinion. You got yours, but I've got mine. But when you sit down and you share with people unrefutable facts, they're pushed into a corner where they cannot gainsay nor resist the truth. And that's what Paul did. He would go into the synagogues, and he would dialogue with these people, and he would nail them with his apologetics his logic, and they could not deny it. They could not do it. The Lord can be understood and known. In Jeremiah chapter 9, I'll read this right quick. It says this, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Now, folks, that's the solid rock that belief is based upon. When you understand the Lord, when you know the Lord, then you can believe in the Lord. But you cannot believe in the Lord if you do not understand Him, if you do not know Him any more than you can believe in anybody that you know anywhere. If you do not understand them and if you do not know them. But let Him glory in this, that He understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So what must a person do to be saved? The answer was given to the Philippian jailer. The answer was believe. And when you read that chapter carefully, you find out that there was, there was evidence for that believing to be based upon There was a testimony of many because the world was being turned upside down by the testimony, folks. 
And these were eyewitnesses of his majesty. These were people that knew the Lord. Many of them from the time that he was born in Bethlehem's manger. For over 30 years, he lived on this planet with men, with women, with children. He was known as the carpenter's son. He was known for that three years and a half or so that he went out into the public ministry. He was known. His works were observed. Miraculous things that can only be credited to God. What must a person do to be saved? Believe. I'm going to go over some things real quick because our time is gone. Examples of those who did get saved and the prevailing circumstances that resulted in them getting saved. It's interesting to read the Bible about different ones that did get saved, the jailer being one of them. Now, what was it that resulted in his getting saved? Well, one thing it was desperation. He came to a point of desperation in his life. And he was getting ready to kill himself. He was that desperate. But in the backdrop, there was this great earthquake. Now, when did an earthquake go beyond opening the doors to an inner prison? And I say beyond that by taking off the shackles that are around prisoners' legs. Well, that happened. And he goes springing in with a light, and all of a sudden he sees this thing. Now, how do you explain this kind of thing? And all of a sudden it begins to connect in his mind now. Here's the same man that got locked up for preaching about salvation. And all of a sudden my eyes are seeing something here that human reason cannot explain. How do you explain these shackles coming off of these legs? How do you explain these doors being up? How do you explain why they didn't run away? And all of a sudden he was brought to the end of himself. And he said, sirs. What must I do to be saved? He couldn't deny the evidence. And the man got saved. What about Nicodemus? He was a master in Israel. John chapter 3. But he had a secret ignorance. There were things that he didn't know. And he didn't really want to let people know about his ignorance in spiritual matters because of the pride that's in there. And he had all this insecurity about his relationship with God. And, and all of this troubled him to the point that by night he goes to see the Lord to kind of get it straightened out, get some answers because he's heard a lot of things about this man. And the Lord told him what he needed here. What he taught him was, you don't love God. Truth is, you hate him. You hate him. That man got off in a corner at some point after the Lord left him because the Lord didn't try to squeeze out of him a, a, a profession of faith. He just walked off and left with what he told him. And he got to study in those thoughts and he realized the truth of it. And all of a sudden, he realized he was a lost man. He was not ready to stand before a holy God because he was wicked, and he knew it. And he got saved. Then there was the Ethiopian eunuch. It's amazing to read that passage and, and study there the passion the desire that this man had to, 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 to know the Lord. And he he kind of reminds me of a, of a later, uh, uh, in other words, a person kind of like the Queen of Sheba who traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to hear the wisdom of, of Solomon to prove him with hard questions. And here's this Ethiopian eunuch that comes from the same place Queen Sheba did, and he travels all the way to Jerusalem. And, and no doubt because of hearing something about 
these things that resulted in the world being turned upside down, he goes up there and somehow or other he ends up with the scriptures. And he's riding back in his buggy. He hadn't had anybody yet to come up to him and explain to him what all this meant. And God sent Philip and tells him, you go down there where this eunuch is. And he's sitting there reading the Bible and he needs somebody to explain it to him. So Philip goes up there and he asks him, understand us how what thou readest? And the eunuch said, how can I accept some man show me? Folks, you're going to get, you're going to experience, if you do not know the Lord, you're going to experience reading the Bible and, and it not making sense to you. This was the eunuch's experience. He didn't understand it. He'd read passages and it make any sense to him. That's the value of coming to church. That's why God raises up pastors and teachers and evangelists. That's why he raises them up. To teach you how to understand these things. That's the value of reading about the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And then there's Cornelius. He was devout. He feared God. He gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. And that's important to read that in Acts chapter 10. And the reason is because we see that God responded to it and sent an angel to Cornelius to tell him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Don't tell me that a lost person can't pray and God doesn't hear him. This man was lost as he could be. And God heard his prayers. And he sent Peter there to explain to him more perfectly concerning Jesus Christ and the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And the man got saved. Then there was a thief on the cross. Here was a man that had never done a good thing in his life, I guess. He comes to the end of everything. And there he is dying on a cross as a thief. And what we read about him is this testimony. It says, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He saw the truth about himself, how wicked he was. He saw the innocence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he turns to the Lord and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus immediately responded, immediately responded, and said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. If you think that you're beyond the Lord's reach, you need to go read this again. Here was a man who never did one thing, one thing in this world that would serve as some kind of credit in the mind of God. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Here was a man who got saved by the mercy of God and the grace of God alone. That's it. No works. He just believed in the Lord. And he got saved. Well, there's so many other things that could be said. I could stand up here, I tell you, till in the morning talking about all these things and there's just no end to this book. But let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we've had to look into the Word. I do pray that something said would serve to be an encouragement. We just thank you for all that you are and for the great salvation that you provided us. Uh, we're not as so many in this world that are without hope who sit in dark, darkness, the ignorance of dark, dark, darkness of ignorance, uh, having no hope whatsoever. We thank you that our, our trust is in thee. Bless us, we pray, that we might use those things 
uh, for thy glory, for thy great name's sake, until you come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 389. 389 will be our closing song. We'll stand together. Let's look to the Lord in a closing prayer as Mr. Michael Pies leads us. Amen.